Hello, we're some of the students who created the film you're about to watch. From first idea to final cut, this was an entirely student-run production. Now, the film does deal with sensitive, politically charged topics, and making it definitely took us out of our comfort zones. We come from very different backgrounds and we hold widely different political beliefs. But we shared a goal, and that was to bring this film to life. We invite you to lean in, even when some of this might feel uncomfortable or downright infuriating, and listen to the end with an open mind. We hope you enjoy the film. I care a lot about the Constitution and patriotism. I care about um, a living wage for everyone. I care about racial equity. Um, economics. It's freedom of speech in the First Amendment. Reproductive rights, queer issues, LGBTQ rights. Uh, Pro-life issues are big to me. Prison abolition. Gun control and gun violence. Right to life, um, gun rights. Simply kind of returning a sense of civility to politics. Um, I'm definitely more on the liberal side. I'm very much so, uh, I would say, principled conservative. A very staunch, like, moving to, like, leftist. And I identify as a progressive. Progressive liberal. I'd say Democrat. Conservative. Conservative. Center-right, uh, libertarian. I'm a socialist. I made the decision to run for president after Charlottesville. Close your eyes and remember what you saw. August 11th and 12th, 2017. That was a news story that was entirely separate from a location. It was the word Charlottesville that was an amorphous concept, not a real place. This is still today how they talk about Charlottesville in the news. Hundreds of white nationalists storming the University of Virginia. A car was driven into a crowd in the U.S. city of Charlottesville, Virginia. It was one of the darkest chapters in recent memory and led to a firestorm of controversy that encompassed the city, the nation, and the presidency. I toured UVA exactly a month before that, and I remember it was my first time being in Charlottesville, and I was like, this place is like so idyllic, it's so nice, like I knew nothing about UVA history. I got here and I saw just how, you know, this is literally, used to be a slave plantation. UVA was definitely like the perfect place for something like that to happen. It took me until well into my first year to realize no, they were walking the lawn, the Thomas Jefferson statue that's like right over there. Um, that was where people were surrounded by neo-Nazis. 100% what August 11th and 12th should have done is, is reaffirm the idea that this is not something we stand for, condone as an institution, as a society, as, as, as a people. And it of course should plunge us into a discussion. And that's where though, you need to make sure that you're showing respect just for the sake of the fact that they're human and have human dignity. There are going to be 
different sides of an issue that everyone agrees on. Unfortunately, since that event, I don't think things have um, gotten better. They're just kind of simmering um, under the surface. If you want the Thomas Jefferson statue, then you must be a white supremacist. You want this, you want um, Lewis and Clark, you must be a white supremacist. Um, all, all, all kinds of insanity. I love the fact that UVA was founded by Thomas Jefferson. I love what Thomas Jefferson did for the country. I love that I'm at this school that is so historic. I support this statement by President Ryan. Quote, as long as I am president, the University of Virginia will not walk away from Thomas Jefferson, end quote. History is a story, but I think its entirety should be told. Um, and so the good parts of it, I don't think, um, should make you not talk about the bad parts, and, and that goes for Jefferson. But on the same, uh, the other side of the token, the, the bad parts don't get to negate the good outright. And to walk away from Jefferson would be to do exactly that. You know, the, the ideals of democracy, of religious liberty, of that, that built the nation that we're in today. The good it's produced, I think, at the university um, and across the world, honestly. You know, I think it saved the world from the brink of destruction. I think it's helped a lot of people in the process um, and produced our country, at least probably the most good for the most people in human history and to walk away from that and not grapple with it because of dark evil parts of his past don't get me wrong i don't think does anybody a, a genuine service i don't like that quote by ryan in general just because student activists and student organizers we're not asking the university to step away from thomas jefferson we're asking them to like paint the whole picture when you put a man like that on a pedestal, you're not really allowing, you know, the other narrative to come in of, you know, the fact that he started raping Sally Hemings when she was 15. The Small Collections Library has tons of his documents, and a lot of those documents, he's basically saying that, you know, black people are subhuman, that they don't have a place in American democracy. And that's also the funny thing. It's like, when we're talking about Thomas Jefferson and this great legacy, you know, these ideas, you know, it's like justice for who? Democracy for who? Uh, uh, to respond to a little bit of that, um, I would say when we ask like democracy for who or who the university was for, I think the answer is right here, the people sitting in the room. I think the answer is the people going to the university currently. Um, no matter what Jefferson's exact vision was, um, we were able to take it and we were able to perfect it using the history that we got to see, using um, everything that happened, everything that he did wrong and everything that he did right, um, we were able to correct that. The reason we are all here is thanks to Thomas Jefferson. He built this school. Um, maybe at the time it wasn't intended for any of us. To say that I'm thankful for that or that I want to honor that is not to say that any commentary on slavery or any of the things that happened. I think it's an immense privilege to be able to take Thomas Jefferson's ideas and that be the most important part of him to you. Um, like, my ancestors were not the people that Thomas Jefferson owned and brutalized. And I think because of that, it's, it's a lot easier for me to kind of go, oh, yes, his writings are so great, right, to kind of divide this person. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that for a lot of people, that is just an impossible thing to do. When we say Thomas Jefferson is the reason why the University of Virginia is here, it's like, that's a part of it, right? But let's also talk about the fact that the reason why the University of Virginia is here is because the University of Virginia knocked down historically black neighborhoods to build, you know, parts of the campus and to build the hospital. Let's talk about that. Like, let's talk about the fact that over 5,000 slaves built common grounds between the years 1817 to like the 1860s. Like, that's why the university's here. Slavery is the reason why the university's here. We just have to paint the whole picture.
comment on a couple of things. Uh, so for example, be it, that it's a privilege to say, well, I can go and I can take his writings and I can say I like that. I think um, that's what history is, being able to take the good parts of people and say, this is what we're going to uphold and the bad parts and saying, this is what we're going to leave behind. Um, Woodrow Wilson, a lot of people hold him up as this progressive, but he also, he showed um, Birth of a Nation in the White House, who's probably a Klan's member. And people will openly make that choice, say, no, Woodrow Wilson was still a good liberal progressive. And I agree with you, we definitely have to paint the whole picture. Um, and we can't just say, oh, look at this great architecture. We have to also say, who built the architecture, right? That, that's completely understandable. I think the political environment at UVA right now is very tense, <laughs> and I think that is the culmination of the events of the last five, six years. Trump's election in 2016, the events of August 11th and 12th, um, the 2020 election, uh, the insurrection at the Capitol. Unfortunately, what you see are two very um, bipolar extremes. The first ones that obviously come to mind are, you know, on the left you got YDSA, and on the right you got YAF. I'm chair of the Young Democratic Socialists of America. I am involved in Young Americans for Freedom at UVA. I'm the president of the club. I've met a lot of people who don't know that I'm conservative and there's no problems and everything's normal. All those things that we have in common um, are kind of overlooked and that comes from people getting so much into the binary of good and bad being associated with left and right. As soon as they find out you're conservative, they might say, well, you hate women, you hate immigrants, you hate everybody, essentially. There definitely has been this big like divide between students, which is unfortunate because really I think that we need to like remember that like our enemy is like, you know, UVA administration, you know, it's the Board of Visitors, it's, you know, kind of white supremacy in general. If we really want to see white supremacy and bigotry and fascism off of our campus, we need to be organizing it off of our campus. We need to be out organizing these people, right? Cancel culture is a problem in university culture and young culture, in this leaning Marxist culture where if we don't like it, we're just going to get rid of it. We're not going to debate it out. We're not going to challenge it. We're just going to cancel it, which is super harmful. As with many other universities um, here at UVA, we have a strong culture of student self-censorship. Um, I mean, there are, there are multiple polls, I think like maybe even by Gallup that show most of the majority of college students do not feel comfortable expressing their own views. And I think that's definitely true here at the University of Virginia. Personally, that I just don't, I, it's hard for me to even just be like friends with like more liberal people. Um, because like if any kind of politics get, it gets brought up, you just have to kind of, you got, you got to be silent um, because otherwise people, people turn on you nine times out of 10. I think we've really gotten away from the idea of civility, the idea that we need to have common ground and that we agree on certain fundamental principles. I hate the fact that people are like, we need to be civil because I'm like, I don't want to be civil. I want to be chaotic. I want to be creative and crazy. And I want us to question our world for the better. Also, like, what is civility in a country that's so violent, right? When like thousands of black men have died at the hands of police and no one's doing anything about it. Why do I owe it, you know, to frankly people that have been oppressing me? But if we want liberation, you know, if we want a revolution, are we going to get it by saying please and thank you, or are we going to get it by taking it? I have been bullied for my political views. When I started telling people openly that I wasn't liberal, um, people definitely treated me differently, and also uh, being the president of YAF, I have gotten a lot of DMs um, like threatening our group and threatening the people in it and people directing others to come to our page and get our names and cyberbully us. It's, it's really just ridiculous to be associated with some of the most evil things that exist in the world and it's just said to you as if it means nothing. I, I think obviously my experience is quite different being that I'm a liberal and I have openly progressive beliefs. They've definitely had some cyberbullying, weirdly um, on both the far right and the left. Uh, I used to be a Cavalier Daily opinion writer and I wrote one article that angered a lot of people on the right 
and I had an Infowars article written about me and like some conservative news shows picked it up. I had like, you know, pretty vile internet comments, people saying they wanted to kick my teeth in and so on. And then I wrote another article defending, um, actually defending Yaf against another columnist who argued that they should be punished for saying what I viewed as constitutionally protected speech. And I had people on UVA leftist Twitter saying that they wanted to slap me across the face and someone calling me the ghost of Rush Limbaugh. So what it's really made me realize is that the internet is a terrible forum for having good and reasoned debate. I think people get a lot of social capital by dunking um, on people that they disagree with and kind of having a villain of the day. And, you know, I, I've had the experience of being multiple political beliefs, villain of the day, and it was very weird. The part that really gets me is that when we do events, we don't tell people, we don't publicize our posts online where the event is usually because we can't. We've had multiple police re reports and cases made, um, not because I wanted to, but because we had to. You can't just say, yeah, we disagree. It's like, no, you're shunned out of the conversation. I've decided everything I know, everything about you from one word, conservative, right-leaning. Frustrates me when, when I see these kind of things happening and I go like, you're not gonna convince anyone of anything doing that. Like you make yourself the boogeyman that a lot of conservatives think liberals are. I'm a liberal Democrat, but at the same point, kind of one of my biggest frustrations with um, political discourse here on grounds is that, um, at least on the left, and if you look at Twitter especially, um, it's my way or it's the highway. The problems, and I think that also, unfortunately, um, just simply the presidency of um, you know Donald Trump, I think has really kind of uh, divided our country. And the right especially, I think, has become just uh, such an extreme now. Personally, um, I would disagree with this, the statement that the right has gone to the extreme. Um, a lot of what the right is doing is just reacting to what's happening on the left. You don't have somebody like Donald Trump who's just willing to ram people over, um, then they're, then you're not going to get listened to at all. Um, that's the problem. So you either have conservatives have been given the option. Um, I'm either going to go to my own space, I'm going to go to Parler, I'm going to go to Telegram, I'm going to go to somewhere else, or I'm going to have to just run into the space and I'm going to have to crush people um, because that's the option we've been given. I think that, yes, definitely the left has gone much further to the left over the past four years um, in response to Trump. What really kind of frustrates me, though, is the fact that uh, you're seeing this blind adherence to uh, a demagogue, to be quite honest with you. I think that now, after what you've seen, especially the response that you had after the 2020 election, he's the worst president in American history, hands down. He orchestrated a riot um, with the goal of subverting American democracy. And I think that this adherence and blind faith in this individual, I mean, you know, you're kind of sitting there, you're wondering, you know, you guys drank the Kool-Aid? I mean, I mean, when are you all gonna go down to Guyana and, uh, you know, never mind, but um, jokes aside, it's just simply this blind adherence. I think one of the reasons why I identify as a progressive rather than a leftist is that on college campuses, um, a lot of leftists are very anti-freedom of speech. The thing about free speech, right, is that it depends on who's saying it. It's, it's almost an oxymoron to say free speech is not something that should be up for debate. I think free speech is one of the most imperative values in this country and at this university. That being said, I think free speech has its limits. Um, hate speech, for example. We're finding ourselves literally in a place where all of a sudden, you know, what, what free speech is allowed is, is, is a discussion. In my ideal world, I think the solution to hate speech being covered by free speech is, you know, some sort of constitutional amendment. What I'm worried about is we're going to get to a point where hate speech is just simply defined as anything we disagree with. It's not as simple as like just saying free speech, right? Like it's never that simple. One of my favorite like Stokely Carmichael quotes is, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. But if a white man has the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Again, I think we have to think a lot about power and who holds the power. Freedom of speech is the hill that I've chosen to fight and die on. 
you look back at American history, um, all forms of social progressivism have been controversial. Um, and in a lot of ways, the state has tried to silence it. But because of the First Amendment, they can't. It sounds good to try to keep neo-Nazis from saying what they want to say, but then the wrong person gets in power and all of a sudden saying Black Lives Matter is hate speech. Hate speech is protected speech. Yeah, I think that it's a really slippery slope about like defining, like if we're to say hate speech isn't protected, it's like what defines hate speech. So yeah, I think that's kind of my main concern. Yeah, I would also say it can't be defined. And so once you just outlaw hate speech, you do fall down that slippery slope. But in a general sense, I just, I fear limiting speech and dialogue in any way, shape or form, because the second you do it, you just put a stop sign up to any sort of uh, societal progression. Uh, it's by talking about what we might consider to be hateful that we can affirm it to be hateful. Uh, you know, that's how you disavow horrible ideas or affirm truths. Who decides what hate speech is, is fundamentally up to the government. And I think it is in the best interest of both left-wing belief systems and right-wing belief systems that the state is not involved in deciding whether or not their beliefs are popular enough to be protected. I want to add, I subscribe philosophically to the concept that there is only speech. You don't need to call it free. You don't need to call it hateful. There is just speech. In a free society, all speech is allowed. Once it's not speech, it's violence. And that's something different. It's nice that we can all agree on this, but um, unfortunately, a majority of college students don't think hate speech should be protected. Something that I think about all the time that's a little frustrating to me is that I do see my fellow progressives often um, getting behind uh, wanting to limit so-called hate speech. And I think that's ultimately really harmful. And I think where that comes from is that they see certain right-wing figures talk about free speech and they go, well, if the right likes it, then it must be bad for the left. Therefore, I have to be against it. As someone who is progressive, I think that progressives best achieve their cause by embracing freedom of speech, by embracing civil liberties that benefit everyone. Beta Bridge, uh, so obviously Beta Bridge cuts through Rugby Road. It's a site where you have a lot of students who are coming out and they'll paint messages, uh, you know, whether it be you know, pancakes for Parkinson's, fraternity and sorority life, or political causes. It's somewhere where really the university is kind of able to go to that space, be able to relay a message, and where the community is able then in turn to see it. All right, well, what do we want to paint? Like, yes, we, we disagree on a lot, but also I think just being here and, you know, having the off-camera conversations and relating on UVA stuff means we have a lot in common. Something that also I think that shows differences, but the fact that differences are okay, you know, because I think all of our discussion is uh, we didn't, you know, you haven't said anything to me hoping that I'll just suddenly join your side, just hoping that we, but I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but it was hoping that we could engage in a conversation. You know, and at the end of the day, we, we respect that we simply believe both things and we can hash things out. Well, the way in which I would look at it is what's kind of that overarching thing that we can kind of tie ourselves back to. I think on a broad level, we can all say, you know, we're Americans and that's really what kind of unites us. But I think that um, on a more micro level here at the university, I think it's the fact that we're all University of Virginia students, that we're all Wahoos. And at the end of the day, you know, we may be um, from red states, blue states, and we may have uh, these different um, you know, attitudes and so forth regarding politics. But at the end of the day, we all bleed uh, blue and orange. And I think that that's something that we ought to um, try to incorporate in there in some way. Well, something we can do that um, the older generation in Congress doesn't get done is uh, combine our consensus. We've got to come up with an actual result. <laughs> yeah. um, does anybody have any good ideas for uh, slogans? Don't you all love having your political beliefs at age 20 filmed for posterity I, to haunt you forever? <laughs> I don't know if that will fit on beta. <laughs> It'd be funny if we did like, hashtag hash it out. I don't know, because I know we talked a lot about social media and I think you said ha hash it out. I think you used those exact words. I mean, it'd be funny to do that. And then we can like print out pictures of like different like documents and pictures and like 
politicians, what have you, on beta and like stick it on beta. And it can be like all our different ideas and we're hashing it out. Hashtag, ha I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I like that. I like yeah. That. But it, I, don't, I don't know if we were supposed to dive into colors, <laughs> but I will say, to go off your point, because I like the idea of the commonality that we all go here at the end of the day. Um, you know, Democrat royal blue fades right into navy, and Republican <laughs> red fades right into orange, and how nice would it be for those spectrums to combine for the UVA blue and orange at the end, you know? Yeah. I don't think I could have said it better. You don't mind my asking, why the Virginia Tech shirt? I've just had this for like a million years. I use it to paint Beta Bridge. I don't really care if I get it dirty because it's a Virginia Tech sweatshirt, you know? So, yeah. Um, I enjoyed like the painting, um, even though I didn't do much painting because I'm not an artist. I think I did like one letter. I got a couple of bagels, might go for a third one. Um, so it was, it, it was good. Everybody showed up to Beta Bridge today, uh, uh, and in politics was kind of the last thing uh, that we think of now when we see each other. You know, we've gotten to know each other at this point. As YAF president, I've had really bad Beta Bridge experiences. People come by shouting curse words and uh, flipping us off, and. This has been a totally different experience, and I'm still YAF president while doing it. And I'm with people who totally disagree with everything that I do as club president, yet it doesn't matter, and that's awesome. I think something that's kind of concerning is that, you know, as we look for common ground, we also have to keep in mind, like, what does that look like on these issues of, like, white supremacy, racism, sexism. There's, there's no place for common ground on those issues. Either we eradicate it or we don't. I don't think anyone's mind was changed from this. I don't really think that was the purpose of what we were doing. You sit here and you listen to folks talk about how uh, you know, the political discourse in this country is never going to improve, that things are just headed south. And I think that that's not true. I think that the real question is uh, whether or not we can actually go out there and engage with folks who disagree with us though. And that, that's the big thing. I don't know, maybe it's just because it's like COVID. It's been really interesting and kind of fun to, you know, just do something as silly as like painting Beta Bridge. This feels like UVA, just like painting Beta with some like people, you know. You just watched some college students from across the political spectrum work together to try and find common ground. And no, we did not solve every problem facing politics today, and we might not have even changed many minds. But we did do what few others seem willing to do. We got together, we talked about our differences, and we worked together to achieve a shared goal. We learned that it is possible to bring people together to at least look for common ground. And more importantly, this doesn't have to stop just at UVA. We're inviting schools from across the country to participate in what we're calling the Common Grounds Campus Challenge. Just imagine if our collective efforts could lead to a whole new era of cooperation in America. Never hurts to dream. You can find more information at the following link. Thank you for watching.